This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Moira Fogarty. The Gerard Street Mystery by John Charles Dent. Part 3. Out into the street I rushed like a madman, banging the door after me. I knew that Johnny would follow me for an explanation, so I ran like lightning round the next corner, and thence down to Young Street. Then I dropped into a walk, regained my breath, and asked myself what I should do next. Suddenly I bethought me of Dr. Marsden, an old friend of my uncle's. I hailed a passing cab and drove to his house. The doctor was in his consultation room, and alone. Of course he was surprised to see me, and gave expression to some appropriate words of sympathy at my bereavement. "'But how is it that I see you so soon?' he asked. "'I understood that you were not expected for some months to come.' Then I began my story, which I related with great circumstantiality of detail, bringing it down to the moment of my arrival at his house. He listened with the closest attention, never interrupting me by a single exclamation until I had finished. Then he began to ask questions, some of which I thought strangely irrelevant. "'Have you enjoyed your usual good health during your residence abroad?' "'Never better in my life. I have not had a moment's illness since you last saw me. And how have you prospered in your business enterprises?' "'Reasonably well. But pray, doctor, let us confine ourselves to the matter in hand. I have come for friendly, not professional advice.' "'All in good time, my boy,' he calmly remarked. This was tantalizing. My strange narrative did not seem to have disturbed his serenity in the least degree. "'Did you have a pleasant passage?' he asked, after a brief pause. "'The ocean, I believe, is generally rough at this time of year.' "'I felt a little squeamish for a day or two after leaving Melbourne,' I replied, "'but I soon got over it, and it was not very bad even while it lasted. I am a tolerably good sailor.' and you have had no special ground of anxiety of late, at least not until you receive this wonderful letter, he added with a perceptible contraction of his lips, as though trying to repress a smile. Then I saw what he was driving at. Doctor, I exclaimed with some exasperation in my tone, pray dismiss from your mind the idea that what I have told you is the result of a diseased imagination. I am as sane as you are. The letter itself affords sufficient evidence that I am not quite such a fool as you take me for. My dear boy, I don't take you for a fool at all, although you are a little excited just at present. But I thought you said you returned the letter to, ahem, your uncle? For a moment I had forgotten that important fact, but I was not altogether without evidence that I had not been the victim of a disordered brain. My friend Gridley could corroborate the receipt of the letter and its contents. My cousin could bear witness that I had displayed an acquaintance with facts which I would not have been likely to learn from any one but my uncle. I had referred to his wig and overcoat, and had mentioned to her the name of Mr. Marcus Weatherly, a name which I had never heard before in my life. I called Dr. Marsden's attention to these matters, and asked him to explain them if he could. "'I admit,' said the doctor, "'that I don't quite see my way to a satisfactory explanation just at present.' but let us look the matter squarely in the face. During an acquaintance of nearly thirty years, I always found your uncle a truthful man, who was cautious enough to make no statements about his neighbours that he was not able to prove. Your informant, on the other hand, does not seem to have confined himself to facts. He made a charge of forgery against a gentleman whose moral and commercial integrity are unquestioned by all who know him. I know Marcus Weatherly pretty well, and am not disposed to pronounce him a forger and a scoundrel upon the unsupported evidence of a shadowy old gentleman who appears and disappears in the most mysterious manner, and who cannot be laid hold of and held responsible for his slanders in a court of law. And it is not true, as far as I know and believe, that Marcus Weatherly is embarrassed in his circumstances. Such confidence have I in his solvency and integrity that I would not be afraid to take up all his outstanding paper without asking a question." If you will make inquiry, you will find that my opinion is shared by all the bankers in the city, and I have no hesitation in saying that you will find no acceptances with your uncle's name to them either, in this market or elsewhere. That I will try to ascertain to-morrow, I replied. 
Meanwhile, Dr. Marsden, will you oblige your old friend's nephew by writing to Mr. Junius Gridley, and asking him to acquaint you with the contents of the letter, and the circumstances under which I received it? Well, it seems an absurd thing to do, he said, but I will if you like. What shall I say? And he sat down at his desk to write the letter. It was written in less than five minutes. It simply asked for the desired information, and requested an immediate reply. Below the doctor's signature I added a short postscript in these words. My story about the letter and its contents is discredited. Pray answer fully, and at once. W.F.F. At my request the doctor accompanied me to the post office on Toronto Street, and dropped the letter into the box with his own hands. I bade him good night, and repaired to the Rossin house. I did not feel like encountering Alice again until I could place myself in a more satisfactory light before her. I dispatched a messenger to her with a short note, stating that I had not discovered anything important, and requesting her not to wait up for me. Then I engaged a room and went to bed. But not to sleep. All night long I tossed about from one side of the bed to the other, and at daylight, feverish and unrefreshed, I strolled out. I returned in time for breakfast, but ate little or nothing. I longed for the arrival of ten o'clock when the banks would open. After breakfast I sat down in the reading room of the hotel, and vainly tried to fix my attention upon the local columns of the morning's paper. I remember reading over several items time after time, without any comprehension of their meaning. After that I remember... Nothing. Nothing? All was blank for more than five weeks. When consciousness came back to me, I found myself in bed in my own old room, in the house on Gerard Street, and Alice and Dr. Marsden were standing by my bedside. No need to tell how my hair had been removed, nor about the bags of ice that had been applied to my head. No need to linger over any details of the pitiless fever that burned in my brain. No need either to linger over my progress back to convalescence, and thence to complete recovery. In a week from the time I have mentioned, I was permitted to sit up in bed, propped up by a mountain of pillows. My impatience would brook no further delay, and I was allowed to ask questions about what had happened in the interval which had elapsed since my overwrought nerves gave way under the prolonged strain upon them. First, Junius Gridley's letter in reply to Dr. Marsden was placed in my hands. I have it still in my possession, and I transcribe the following copy from the original now lying before me. Boston, December 22, 1861. Dr. Marsden, in reply to your letter, which has just been received, I have to say that Mr. Furlong and myself became acquainted for the first time during our recent passage from Liverpool to Boston in the Persia, which arrived here Monday last. Mr. Furlong accompanied me home, and remained until Tuesday morning, when I took him to see the public library, the State House, the Athenaeum, Fanoil Hall, and other points of interest. We casually dropped into the post office, and he remarked upon the great number of letters there. At my instigation, made of course in jest, he applied at the general delivery for letters for himself. He received one bearing the Toronto postmark. He was naturally very much surprised at receiving it, and was not less so at its contents. After reading it he handed it to me, and I also read it carefully. I cannot recollect it word for word, but it professed to come from his affectionate uncle, Richard Yardington. It expressed pleasure at his coming home sooner than had been anticipated, and hinted in rather vague terms at some calamity. He referred to a lady called Alice, and stated that she had not been informed of Mr. Furlong's intended arrival. There was something, too, about his presence at home being a recompense to her for recent grief which she had sustained. It also expressed the writer's intention to meet his nephew at the Toronto railway station upon his arrival, and stated that no telegram need be sent. This, as nearly as I can remember, was about all there was in the letter. Mr. Furlong professed to recognize the handwriting as his uncle's. It was a cramped hand, not easy to read, and the signature was so peculiarly formed that I was hardly able to decipher it. The peculiarity consisted of the extreme irregularity in the formation of the letters, no two of which were of equal size, and capitals were interspersed promiscuously, more especially throughout the surname. 
Mr. Furlong was much agitated by the contents of the letter, and was anxious for the arrival of the time of his departure. He left by the B&A train at 11.30. This is really all I know about the matter, and I have been anxiously expecting to hear from him ever since he left. I confess that I feel curious, and should be glad to hear from him, that is, of course, unless something is involved which it would be impertinent for a comparative stranger to pry into. Yours, etc., Junius H. Gridley. So that my friend has completely corroborated my account, so far as the letter was concerned. My account, however, stood in no need of corroboration, as will presently appear. When I was stricken down, Alice and Dr. Marsden were the only persons to whom I had communicated what my uncle had said to me during our walk from the station. They both maintained silence in the matter, except to each other. Between themselves, in the early days of my illness, they discussed it with a good deal of feeling on each side. Alice implicitly believed my story from first to last. She was wise enough to see that I had been made acquainted with matters that I could not possibly have learned through any ordinary channels of communication. In short, she was not so enamoured of professional jargon as to have lost her common sense. The doctor, however, with the mole-blindness of many of his tribe, refused to believe. Nothing of this kind had previously come within the range of his own experience, and it was therefore impossible. He accounted for it all upon the hypothesis of my impending fever. He is not the only physician who mistakes cause for effects, and vice versa. During the second week of my prostration, Mr. Marcus Weatherly absconded. This event so totally unlooked for by those who had had dealings with him, at once brought his financial condition to light. It was found that he had been really insolvent for several months past. The day after his departure a number of his acceptances became due. These acceptances proved to be four in number, amounting to exactly forty-two thousand dollars. So that that part of my uncle's story was confirmed. One of the acceptances was payable in Montreal, and was for two thousand two hundred and eighty-three dollars and seventy-six cents. The other three were payable at different banks in Toronto. These last had been drawn at sixty days, and each of them bore a signature presumed to be that of Richard Yardington. One of them was for $8,972.11, another was for $10,114.63, and the third and last was for $20,629.50. A short sum in simple addition will show us the aggregate of these three amounts. $39,000. $716.24, which was the amount for which my uncle claimed that his name had been forged. Within a week after these things came to light, a letter addressed to the manager of one of the leading banking institutions of Toronto arrived from Mr. Marcus Weatherly. He wrote from New York, but stated that he should leave there within an hour from the time of posting his letter. He voluntarily admitted having forged the name of my uncle to the three acceptances above referred to, and entered into other details about his affairs which, though interesting enough to his creditors at that time, would have no special interest to the public at the present day. The banks where the acceptances had been discounted were wise after the fact, and detected numerous little details wherein the forged signatures differed from the genuine signatures of my uncle Richard. In each case they pocketed the loss and held their tongues, and I dare say they will not thank me for calling attention to the matter, even at this distance of time. There is not much more to tell. Marcus Weatherly, the forger, met his fate within a few days after writing his letter from New York. He took passage at New Bedford, Massachusetts, in a sailing vessel called the Petrel, bound for Havana. The Petrel sailed from port on the 12th of January, 1862, and went down in mid-ocean with all hands on the 23rd of the same month. She sank in full sight of the captain and crew of the city of Baltimore, Inman Line, but the hurricane prevailing was such that the latter were unable to render any assistance or to save one of the ill-fated crew from the fury of the waves. At an early stage in the story I mentioned that the only fictitious element should be the name of one of the characters introduced. The name is that of Marcus Weatherly himself. The person whom I have so designated really bore a different name one that is still remembered by scores of people in Toronto. He has paid the penalty of his misdeeds, 
and I see nothing to be gained by perpetuating them in connection with his own proper name. In all other particulars the foregoing narrative is as true as a tolerably retentive memory has enabled me to record it. I don't propose to attempt any psychological explanation of the events here recorded, for the very sufficient reason that only one explanation is possible. The weird letter and its contents, as has been seen, do not rest upon my testimony alone. With respect to my walk from the station with Uncle Richard, and the communication made by him to me, all the details are as real to my mind as any other incidents of my life. The only obvious deduction is, that I was made the recipient of a communication of the kind which the world is accustomed to regard as supernatural. Mr. Owen's publishers have my full permission to appropriate this story in the next edition of his Debatable Land Between This World and the Next. Should they do so, their readers will doubtless be favoured with an elaborate analysis of the facts, and with a pseudo-philosophic theory about spiritual communion with human beings. My wife, who is an enthusiastic student of electrobiology, is disposed to believe that Weatherley's mind, overweighted by the knowledge of his forgery, was in some occult manner, and unconsciously to himself, constrained to act upon my own senses. I prefer, however, simply to narrate the facts. I may or may not have my own theory about those facts. The reader is at perfect liberty to form one of his own if he so pleases. I may mention that Dr. Marsden professes to believe to the present day that my mind was disordered by the approach of the fever which eventually struck me down, and that all I have described was merely the result of what he, with delightful periphrasis, calls an abnormal condition of the system induced by causes too remote for specific diagnosis. It will be observed that, whether I was under an hallucination or not, the information supposed to be derived from my uncle was strictly accurate in all its details. The fact that the disclosure subsequently became unnecessary through the confession of Weatherly does not seem to me to afford any argument for the hallucination theory. My uncle's communication was important at the time when it was given to me, and we have no reason for believing that those who are gone before are universally gifted with the knowledge of the future. It was open to me to make the facts public as soon as they became known to me, and had I done so, Marcus Weatherly might have been arrested and punished for his crime. Had not my illness supervened, I think I should have made discoveries in the course of the day following my arrival in Toronto which would have led to his arrest. Such speculations are profitless enough, but they have often formed the topic of discussion between my wife and myself. Gridley, too, whenever he pays us a visit, invariably revives the subject, which he long ago christened the Gerard Street Mystery, although it might just as correctly be called the Young Street Mystery, or the Mystery of the Union Station. He has urged me a hundred times over to publish the story, and now, after all these years, I follow his counsel and adopt his nomenclature in the title. End of the Gerard Street Mystery Part 3 End of Story Read by Moira Fogarty in Toronto, Ontario, October 2006